Well, we are in a series right now uh, called Kingdom Parables, uh, in which uh, we're learning about the kingdoms through this series of parables, these stories that Jesus told in Matthew chapter 13 about how the kingdom works, where the kingdom of God is nothing less than the God of all power, the God of heaven entering our world and transforming uh, all every dimension of human life, eradicating all pain and suffering, ending all evil, wiping away every tear. That's the kingdom of God. And a couple weeks ago, we, we did a little introduction in which we actually looked at the very beginning of this chapter in which the disciples asked Jesus a question. They asked him, Jesus, why do you talk in parables? Why do you tell the people parables? And I think the real question that they were asking, though, is Jesus, why don't you just come with your kingdom now? Just fix things now. Eradicate the evil now. Why do you come in parables? Just show your power. Just do it. Do away with evil and suffering. Make them believe. And Jesus' response here and elsewhere is that that's not how the kingdom works. If Jesus were to do that, if he were just to show up, even today, just to show up in glory and power, that, that would be, uh, that would, it would, and just make people believe. I mean, you, you would have to believe then, right? And, but that would, that's how the kingdom of the world comes. The kingdom of the world comes in this external, coercive way, forcing itself. But that's not how God's kingdom uh, comes. God's kingdom has to get planted inside you. It's like a seed changing you from the inside out. And the Pharisees, the hard-hearted Pharisees and the fickle crowds, they were always asking Jesus, do a miracle, prove, prove who you are, prove it. Um, Jesus, though, instead gives them parables. Because parables get inside you. It's, it's the, the parables are seeds of the gospel. They point to the gospel. And in fact, this is really interesting, the context of Matthew 13. We didn't really look at the context of this chapter. We're doing this chapter-level study in the series. But in the verses leading right up to chapter 13, there's a really interesting exchange between the Pharisees and Jesus. At the end of chapter 12, the Pharisees come to Jesus and they say, Jesus, just do a sign. Prove who you are. And Jesus says, I'm not going to do a sign. They want a miracle. I'm not going to do a miracle. Well, I'll give you a sign. But the only sign I'm going to give you is the a sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Isn't that a fascinating response of Jesus? The Pharisees asked for a miracle. Jesus gave them a parable. But it's a parable about that points to the gospel. It points to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Um, and, and that was the seed of the gospel really coming to them. He, he, as he spoke in parables, it's the seed of the gospel coming, and that's how God's kingdom comes. It doesn't come in the way you would expect. It doesn't come in this forceful, coercive way of God just kind of, kind of making everybody believe. It, it comes, though, with a message, a message that's, that's spoken. And if you think about it, it's a crazy message, it's a crazy message. The, kingdom, the, the gospel of the kingdom is this, that a king has come and he has triumphed by being tortured and killed and now his followers find life by losing life. It's a stupid message. <laughs> that's the message. And, and that's the message that's going to transform the world? And Jesus says, absolutely. It is only that gospel seed of the kingdom planted into people's hearts and changing them from the inside out that's ultimately going to bring complete comprehensive transformation to all of human life and will eventually cover the earth and wipe every bit of evil away. And it kind of makes me think of what Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and 2. He talks about the power of God. But what is the power of God? Is it miracles? No, it's the, it's the gospel. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, 18 to 25. He says, For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles, but to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And then he continues in chapter 2, he says, And so it was with me, brothers and sisters, when I came to you, I did not come with eloquence or human wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness, in great fear and trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power 
so that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. What power? What's the power he's talking about? Uh, did, he, did he come in, I used to think that many came in dis, 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 uh, in miracles, you know, the Spirit's power, maybe, but I think it's more talking about the gospel. What does he say in Romans chapter one? What is, what is the power of God? I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. That's the power, it's the power of the seed. And so it's a different kind of kingdom with a different kind of power, and it comes in a different kind of way than the kingdoms of this world. And this was some of the Pharisees did not get. The hard-hearted Pharisees, they thought that the kingdom was going to come. The Pharisees were the religious leaders of the day, of Jesus' day, and they thought the kingdom was going to come as in this external thing that was going to kind of, he was going to coerce, he was going to force everybody to be really good religious Jews. And the fickle crowds, they also had a misunderstanding of the kingdom. They thought the kingdom was going to come in this forceful way, coercive way to kick out the Roman Empire and liberate them. And then the disciples, they didn't understand any better. They kept waiting for Jesus to show his power and be the king. I mean, with, I mean they had grew up with this idea of what it meant for the kingdom to come and Messiah to come, and they knew Jesus was the Messiah, and so they keep waiting. Are you, is he going to do it now? Is he going to bring it now? With every miracle Jesus did, maybe it's now. He's going to do it now. And Jesus was continually having to give correctives. No, that's not how the kingdom comes, and that's really all this whole series is about. Matthew 13 is all about Jesus giving this corrective, but even then, the disciples still aren't going to get it and they're still having to having this misunderstanding uh, about of the way uh, in which the the kingdom of God would come all the way up to the triumphal entry on the on the day of Palm Sunday the day before the week before Jesus goes to the cross you know Jesus is welcomed into the city of Jerusalem with crowds hailing him king of the Jews and the disciples I'm sure were thinking this is it finally he's coming this is what we've been waiting for and it's exactly how we pictured it except for the donkey I don't get the donkey but everything else is exactly spot on to how we pictured it but then Jesus again has to disappoint them for a day or two later or maybe even the same day some Greeks come and they want to speak to Jesus in other words words starting to get out beyond Palestine about Jesus and a pathway is starting to form for Jesus to he could take this pathway to become king of the world look out Leonardo but that's not his that's his cue Jesus says then this at that moment Jesus replied the hour's come Unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. And so Jesus says that is how the kingdom is going to spread. And that is how the war is going to be won. And that brings us to today's parable. So we're going through the parables in chapter 13, taking one a week. This parable is the parable of the wheat and the tares, or wheat and the weeds. It's a parable about this kingdom conflict and how about, about how the kingdom of God has come, but it has not fully come. I mean, it has come, it's here, and yet it's not fully here and complete because there's still evil in the world, and the enemy is still abroad. The war is still going on, uh, and so this parable illustrates that, but it all il- also illustrates how the war is going to be one. And so I'm just going to go through this parable really quickly. I'm just going to leave you five quick takeaways from this parable that we can glean. Begins with these words, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. Later, when Jesus explains the parable to his disciples, as as Margaret read, uh, he's going to identify that he himself is the sower in this parable. Jesus is. And the field is the world. And, and, and so the first takeaway, uh, so the good seal in his field. It's, in other words, this is his world. It's his field. It belongs to Jesus. So that's point number one. It's his world, his field. And then point number two comes. It also says that the, the man who sowed Jesus sowed good seed. And so number two is what God sows is good. It's always good. He sows good seed. But then the next verse, but while everyone was sleeping, an enemy, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. When the wheat sprouted and formed heads, then the weeds also appeared. So it says here that the enemy basically oversows the good seed of the, the, the owner's field. And what is, what is sowed there by the enemy is, is uh, called uh, weeds in the NIV translation. and other translations, you may see the word tares is the other word. It's the Greek word uh, uh, darnel. And, and what, it was, what Darnell was, was actually it was a grass-like plant. 
And it could actually be mistaken as wheat. It could look like wheat, uh, but it was noxious. It was poisonous. And in some of the parables Jesus tells, he, he uses fictional, these things would never happen kind of things. This actually happened. This would happen. Maybe not all the time, but so much so that Rome actually, the Roman Empire actually had laws against you're not allowed to plant over sow someone's field with Darnell. Uh, that would actually happen. It would kind of uh, constrict the field of your, maybe a rival field to next door. And so the picture here is that Satan comes and he oversows God's field. And Satan oversows with seeds that look like wheat. It looks like life but it's noxious, it's poisonous, which is what sin is and does. And so they grow up in the midst of the wheat. And then I, I find this next verse really interesting. It says, the owner's servants came to him and said, sir, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where then did the weeds come from? Sounds kind of accusatory. Didn't you sow good weed? I mean, I mean, where, 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 did you do this weeds thing? I mean, what... What kind of God are you? What kind of seed? This really speaks to the, to the problem of evil. Where does evil come from? Did you do this, God? Did you, uh, did you plant these weeds? I mean, I mean, what kind of God are you that, that, uh, that there would abuse would happen and famines would come and sickness and, and death? Did you do that, God? And God's answer is no, an enemy did this. And that's number three. God is not responsible for evil Satanists. It started with Adam and Eve in the garden. There's just good seed. God just planted really good seed in the garden. It was, everything was good and perfect and beautiful. But then Satan oversowed with greed and envy and murder. But then God sowed as well. He sowed the prophets. He sowed the kings. Ultimately, he sowed Jesus and us. But Satan then continued to oversow. And that's the pattern of life since the fall. It's part of the struggle. Next verse. The servants asked him, do you want us to go and pull them up? And he answers, no, not yet. No, he answered, because while you're pulling the weeds, you may uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. At that time, I will tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. There is a right time for pulling up the tares and eradicating all evil, but not yet. What is wrong will be made right. What is born of Satan will be burned up, but not yet. And so point number four is, one day God will eradicate all evil. The war will be over, but not yet. But how is the war waged? How is the kingdom spread? And that's point number five we're going to get to in just a second. And it comes in the explanation that Margaret read, uh, in which we already saw that in the explanation Jesus gives, he is the sower, Jesus is the son of man, he's the one who's sowing in his field, and, uh, and the field is, is the world, it's his world. What's the seed? You know, a couple weeks ago, uh, we looked at, or actually last week, we looked at the parable of the sower. In the parable of the sower, uh, the seed was the word of the kingdom. The, it was the gospel being planted in people's hearts, transforming them in, 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 uh, inside out. But here, the good seed is you. We're the good seed. We're the seed that he has planted. So here's the application for us. So that's number five. The kingdom spreads through the seeds. We're the seeds. So here's the application. It's for you and I to know that the evils of this world that you see on news, and there's so much evil we see in this world, all of that, every, all the evil that we see is the over of Satan. But God has an answer to the brokenness and the, and the evil of this world, and the answer is you. You're the seed. Is it going to come fully now, this kingdom thing? No, but you're going to have power. Will there be defeats and struggles along the way? Yeah, it's a war. And will we go to the grave still having some answers, questions? Yes to that too, but here's the encouragement. While there is pain everywhere that we see, and let's face it, we live in a time where we know everything, don't we? 
I mean, you know like that. Every single horrible thing that's going on on this planet, it's never been like that before. It's, you can get so overwhelmed by that and think, how can I possibly make a difference? I, just, I feel so small and insignificant. What could we do in the face of all the evil that we see in this world? Well, into that perspective, there comes the parable that we're going to focus on next week, that the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed, small seems insignificant, but over time it grows and becomes a tree. The kingdom of God is like leaven, worked its way through the dough, seems like a small and insignificant thing, but over time it changes everything. And more on that parable next week. We're going to have a special guest next week, uh, Paul Gossman. He's the director of World Mission Prayer League, which is a mission organization that Pat Lovis uh, was a missionary with. And so we'll be looking at that parable with him next week. But for now, here's the, here's the word of encouragement to us. You are the seed. Bloom where you're planted. Bloom where the sower has planted you. Trust him, his planting of you, where he's placed you. You're part of God's plan for extending his kingdom around the planet. We are the seed, you're the seed, and you may feel insignificant, overwhelmed in the face of the evil and brokenness we see all around us, but don't be discouraged. The kingdom is like a field into which Jesus plants good seed. And you're the seed, and and so am I, and over time it grows and it grows, and it spreads and it spreads from one generation to another. And how does it spread? How does it spread? How does it grow? Through small, mustard seed-sized ways, like going out and picking up trash. That's not this last time, that was from, I think, a previous time, but, but... as we went out and picked up trash yesterday with our orange vests and our little One Hope Church logo, maybe some people saw the kingdom come yesterday. Maybe it's just a small way, but small ways add up to big things. Or maybe, here's another way, it was planted yesterday through Sandy with Kids Club and Sunday, last, yesterday afternoon at our house. Uh, the gospel seed was being planted in those little kids' uh, hearts yesterday, but also Sandy herself, she's the seed. She was planting herself into those little lives. And Jeremiah and Amanda, I stole this from your Facebook page. Don't sue me. I did not ask permission. But uh, Jeremiah and Amanda had their first gathering with, with young adults uh, last Sunday at our place. That was the beginning. Those were seeds being planted. That was wheat starting to grow. And it spreads by us being in the world, not of the world. The warning here is we dare not retreat into a kind of a safe little Christian club. That's the opposite of what God called us to be. He wants us to be in the world, not of the world, but in the world. That's where he's planted us. That's the strategy. It's how the kingdom spreads. And so we're going to be doing Alpha at Cutter's Point, not at a church building. We're going to do it in Cutter's Point and and, uh, starting the first Tuesday after Easter. Uh, We'll go for eight weeks, and goodness, that's why we're meeting here at Ocean 5. Remember that? 2018, we're going to start meeting here, taking the church to where the community gathers because this is God's field here, Ocean 5. This is where God's planted us, plant bloom where we're planted, and it it spreads through. We're going to do the Dragon Boat outreach again in April, I think, and uh, that's just us being planted in this community that we're part of. We're we're part of this community of Gig Harbor, and and so we're just going to be ourselves. We're going to have fun, but who knows what God is going to do as he takes our lives and and, and implants us into the lives of those around us. And what more can we say about this planting of seeds and planting of us in small ways but that add up over time? The more families can be planted in Washington, D.C. the week after Easter, uh, doing worship ministry uh, there. They're part of God's kingdom seeds. My daughter Megan's going to go to Indonesia. Some of you are supporting her. She's one of God's kingdom seeds being planted on the other side of the globe. We're going to be all going to Peace Community Center and, and again, sowing into the lives of, of, of those less fortunate, those, those, the broken, the humble, the, the ones that Jesus said we get the kingdom. We're going to serve them that day. And uh, it comes through us doing doing canceling church and just feeding, uh, making 40,000 meals for Sierra Leone like we did in January. And, in, and the kingdom also comes as a team of us uh, has been planting seeds in the lives of, a, of an Afghan refugee family, just unconditionally loving them, no strings attached, just praying for the day that maybe one day, years from now, perhaps one of them may say, tell me about your Jesus. And so the kingdom comes through us the seeds of the kingdom, as we bloom where we're planted, as we seek to love and serve, being the hands and feet of Jesus, but also being his voice, because the kingdom ultimately comes, ultimately, ultimately spreads 
through the gospel, as the gospel is proclaimed. For the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And so we say with Paul, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. It seems like a stupid message, but it's how God's going to transform the world. And so we proclaim it. It's true. It, it's the way the kingdom works. It's, it's counterintuitive to the way the world works, but that's because we're in a war. And the enemy, it's, we don't follow the, the tactics of the enemy. It's a different tactic. It's a, the it's a, it's a way the kingdom of God works. And so don't be timid. God has not given us a spirit of timidity, but of power. What kind of power? External power? No, it's the power of the seed. The power of the seed that actually falls to the earth and dies. Jesus was that seed that fell to the earth and died, but as he did that, as he sacrificed, as he took the lowest place, it birthed more seeds, and we're those seeds, and now he calls us to follow in his footsteps to also fall to the earth and die, to take up our cross and follow him, and as we do that, more seeds are formed, and that's the way the kingdom spreads. It's upside down, but it's the way the kingdom of God works. Paul said, I die daily. And so we follow him and we follow ultimately Jesus as, as we have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer we who live, but Christ lives in us. Uh, Christ in us, Christ in you, the hope of glory, the hope of the world, the kingdom seed will spread and it is invincible. It will fill the earth. It will eradicate every evil, every suffering. The day will come when every suffering, every evil will be burned up. And all that will remain will be God's kingdom shining like the sun. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for, wow, we get to be part of your strategy for bringing the kingdom and eradicating evil and injustice and suffering. Lord, use us as your seeds. We, we're, by ourselves, we're so insignificant, so small, and yet we trust the sower. You're the sower. You're the one who sows the seed. You're the one that guides this whole thing, and it will, it, and nothing will stop your kingdom coming. But it comes from the inside out in ways that you would not expect. And so we entrust ourselves to you. We say, we volunteer. Our t- I, go, I will go, Lord. Send me where you want me to go. Help us as a church to do that too. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.